Hello and welcome to the Synergia People Podcast 2023. Yeah, my name is Christine Hunter. I was born in Germany at the Lake of Constance. When I was 21, I joined the RV Heraclitus to learn about living at sea. What and is the Heraclitus? The Heraclitus is a 25-meter ferrous cement Chinese junk research vessel. Okay, so you joined when you were 21? 21 years old, yes. For what reason? What made you join? Um, I always wanted to say uh, to sail to sea from when I was a little girl. That was always my dream. My grandfather was a big traveler. He sold surgical instruments in the near and far east in the 20s before the war. So I think I got this yearning for the far away countries, lands from him. Also, I really love water, and at the Lake of Constance, I just always try to look at it in a way so I could see the horizon. Mm -hmm. That was, um, you know, you can see the Alps behind it, but sometimes I dreamt it was the sea so I could see the horizon. So how did you hear about this, and what made you choose this vessel? I mean, um, it came to me um, with a love story. I was going out with a young man from my school and he left to um, travel around the world on his German wonder Jahre. And after we stayed in touch and wrote letters and stuff, and then after three years, he um, said he's going to sail back to Europe. And he uh, wrote me from Sri Lanka and said if I wanted to come. But at the time, I was just making my high school exam or abitur. And I said, no, I can't, but maybe in a little bit. So then a few weeks later, he said he arrived now in Corsica. And so I said, OK, I'm, I'm coming. I met my first love again, Ibis, who became captain later. And I stepped on board the Heraclitus. And that also was instant love. And what kept you going? I mean, now we are um, it was a couple of decades almost, later. <laughs> yeah, almost. Uh, 40 years it, later. Yeah, it was in 1986. So it's, it, it felt like a place where I could do anything I wanted. I learned, I um, had done a little bit of theater before in Germany. And um, we did theater on the ship. And I just really discovered my love for that. And also just to be living together in that way with a lot of people on a boat and arriving in port. That was just marvelous. So what do you mean when you say theater on a boat? And how many people were on board? We were, um, it's always like around 10, 10, 15 people. And we prepared, we did acting classes like once a week and then rehearsals if we would prepare a play. And for the arrival, this was the end of the Around the Tropic World Expedition. And the last leg was basically from Corsica to arrive in Puerto Rico again, which is where that expedition had started three years earlier. So we prepared a big play and I was part of it and we performed it um, on a stage in Puerto Rico in a cafe that also was part of the um, institute's projects and then um, we rebuilt the boat and went up north to release two bottlenose dolphins who had been part of a the Jason the Janus project for interspecies communication with John Lilly and others and the dolphins were supposed to be released back into the wild and we were helping with that and then we that's also then when I made, directed my first play, it was a cabaret about the marshland in Savannah, Georgia, and about the project that we did. It, it felt so complete somehow. Like the, you digest the everything that happens in a, with theater. You can 
interact with people in new ways and different ways and you learn so much about them but of course also about yourself but in a playful way it's mm. not very serious so what is the mission the purpose of this boat and how does it relate to Sunachia Ranch where we are today it was uh, after the ranch it was a second project and to me it's a friendship What do you mean, second project of what? They, uh, well, actually, they had a cafe. Oh, no. Who is they? The, there was 10 or 15 people who got together and decided they, they started doing things together. They bought land and started making buildings out of adobe, which back then was special. And then they made the ranch. And, um, and at some point, they decided they needed to explore planet water because um, it had 75 or 70% of the earth is water. And they made designs and stuff, and then they wanted to actually start building it here. But then they <laughs> realized that it's the first way you can get from the ocean. It would be hard to transport it there because they wanted to build a big ship, not just a boat. And so then they decided okay, we're going to have to go to San Francisco, Oakland. It's made out of ferro-cement, very concrete, so it took them nine months, the actual building, and then there's many adventurous stories when they launched it and, you know, had to, like, troubleshoot um, that it would work properly. Yeah. And what was the purpose, or still is the purpose of the boat? The purpose is to... Um, explore planet ocean, planet water, and also to create contemporary sea people or to um, educate people how to live at sea and then to, to learn because that's how you learn and are very intimately acquainted with nature because it's you live in the wilderness. That was the purpose and that still is the purpose. And now we created a project to kind of like a living archive of um, the stories and the legends and the knowledge of sea people who live along the coast, around, coasts around the world, and also in river deltas and up rivers, the big rivers. Sailing is thousands of years old, and it hasn't changed all that much. Um, there's only so many ways how you can live together on a ship or how an anchor is designed or how the sails are designed. All of this has evolved over the years, of course, but the principle is the same and that makes it like a really wild story. You can tap into really ancient knowledge, like about shipbuilding, about community, about ecology, also marine ecology, you know, beach ecology, um, river deltas, place where fresh water and salt water meet, coral reefs, marshlands, and the high seas, the open ocean. That's really a world where we know so little about. You're doing this almost 40 years now. What kept you going? And what did you get out of it? Well, it's very beautiful to be <laughs> out on the ocean. I mean, it feels like you're floating in space at night. Like, that's some of the most beautiful times when you see the stars reflecting in the sea or you have fluorescence, you have dolphins and whales visiting. And storms are also exciting because, you know, you feel the esprit de corps of the crew. I think I'm, personally, I'm, I like to be alone, but this is the best way to be together with people and... In a, in a ship's crew, you get, you have this respect for each other's space somehow after a while. And you feel this when a new person is coming, they just try to, they have to kind of slowly come and fit into that. And because space on a ship is limited, so people look for their places on the bow and then you are, behind you is, there's a lot of people very close, but in front of you is the open sea. Mm -hmm you're always going somewhere. Also, of course, uh, the tasks that we set ourselves and 
getting to know the sea and the planet and then being able to speak for it um, by experience, by hands-on, like real knowledge, that I think is very important to for people to um, be able to have that experience. You know, to be exposed to that kind of danger and challenge. And sometimes, um, you know, you might not have a lot of vegetables left, so you have to ration things. And that's a good experience. You value food, you value water. Was there ever a very tricky situation where you thought, oh my God, this is it? Yeah, when we were off the coast of South Africa, when we were uh, rounding the Cape of Good Hope, before that, actually in the Mozambique Channel, we got just very strong winds. It was so fast that we didn't have time to take the sails down. And so we had everything up and we had to like ride it out, which is, the ship is fine. It's a very strong ship and it's actually slightly under rigged, so it's more safe. But there was only two guys who could be who could handle the helm, and I remember it was there was moonlight, everything looked green, like our faces looked green and the sea looked green, everything looked green. The Klaus, the captain, we had been working together for decades, and we just were standing on deck next to each other, and we we're just not saying anything. It was just like, okay, well, <laughs> this is it, <laughs> or it's not. You know, then after a few hours, you, you know, you feel it's getting slightly less. And, and then it's just such a great feeling. <laughs> yeah, can imagine. You were saying in an earlier conversation that this is a full-time job for you. So what do you do when you are not on the boat? Um, I'm fundraising and I'm in touch with crew members and also our work about the, the oral history project that um, we're doing, the interviews of other sea people. Yeah, you always have to organize practical things too, like getting materials and it's just holding it, holding the whole operation together because there's times when we are very few people And then there's, that is a lot of work. And then, but when you're a lot of people, it's also a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually try to be near the ship as much as I can. I'm more there than I'm not. So you say you do fundraising. This costs a lot of money. I mean, when you go out for three years, you need to get the boat ready. You need to maintain the boat and all the people on board. How is all of this funded and how difficult it, is it to get the funds for such a project? It's a challenge. When, we're, when the ship is at sea, it's easier because we come by and, and do our work and we have um, spaces on board for um, people to do art residencies or science residencies or they just make a training program. In some cases, we also have guests um, who, who maybe want to participate in a leg of the expedition. Um, so that carries itself, but we also... So they are paying for this. They are paying um, according to where we are and what we do. And we also um, we ask for donations in kind, like materials, um, We often get things at cost price, um, so we do fundraising events when we're in a port. We invite people, we give presentations, um, but it's a constant challenge, and especially for the reconstruction of the ship. Which is going on currently? Yeah, which is going on now, and um, we originally planned to finish the ship in Roses in Spain, um, but we got cut short by or stopped by COVID and now we are um, working with an individual, a group of people in Colombia because we want to make a big 
they want to make a film about the first five to ten years of the ship and then maybe a series pitching it to big um, television companies that ne like Netflix or HBO in, um, in the States. So that would help to get the funding together for the rest of the rebuild. We want to launch the ship April, May and then be in Colombia by July or so. In Colombia is an incredible place right now. We want to go up the, the Magdalene River. There would be a great base to make expeditions. Mm. And we will hopefully be able to raise more funding to complete the, um, the rebuild. And then we can start again going around the Atlantic. That was our dream, actually, to follow the currents around the Atlantic and visit all of those um, sea, sea cultures. Yeah. Coastal cultures. Yeah. Yeah, so imagine the library, the archive of knowledge that we would have and that would be accessible to all of those people also because it would be a floating archive. And how do you manage the languages? Um, we would interview people in their original language, if at all possible, but mostly we, you know, we made friends, we come into a port and then we ask for... Sometimes you have to ask permissions or you find an institute that has already done some kind of work like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's also etiquettes, you know. Um, mm. So this is another five-year project, right? Yeah, at least. So didn't you say you want to stop sailing? Yeah, I mean, it's that's what everybody says. <laughs> And then <laughs> ten years later, oh... Uh, making more plans mm. but that's um, I think the going to see like theater is you can't just give that up but it's also hard um, I'm going to be 59 in September you know sometimes you think oh okay I don't really care about that but because um, I'm surrounded here in the ranch you know nobody's going to stop doing anything right When you would summarize, what is for you the purpose of Sunajia and then the boat as a part of it? Summary. Or if you would have to say, let's put it this way, five words to describe what Sunajia, the boat, stand for. I think it stands for some of the greatest values of humanity, friendship, discipline, knowledge, curiosity, honor, respect for nature, make do with less and have more fun. It's quite a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Thank you for listening and please stay tuned for the next episode of the Synergia People Podcast 2023.